Hey, um, good morning. It's Miguel. <laughs> How are you doing, girl? So today is, what is today anyway? The 28th? It's the 28th of November. So November is coming to a close. And I'm going to bring this just a little bit closer. Um, so yeah, November is coming to a close. And uh, people are getting into the Christmas spirit. Believe it or not, I have not quite gotten into the Christmas spirit. <laughs> I sort of was into it for a while and then I fell out. I stopped listening to uh, Christmas carols in my car <laughs> because instead I was listening to this. Um, I wonder if you can see this. This is a audiobook, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. And I picked this up at the library. You can see it's got like this due date thing. It's got the CDs inside. And wow, I just finished uh, listening to this audiobook program and it is fantastic. I'm going to get a little closer. Let's see what happens if I get closer. This is just an experiment. Wow. Uh, so, um, I'm really enjoying this, uh, audio. I enjoyed it because I finished it yesterday. Let me tell you, I love the way JK Rowling writes. She's just such an accomplished writer. She's just, Everything that she writes, I can just imagine in my mind's eye. And uh, it's so clear. It's almost like she has this natural way of writing that mimics a screenplay. And I can just form the scene that she paints in my mind. And I also love how she takes her time. I mean, it's clear that she is thinking strategically about the story that even little parts have, um, you know, they're, it's almost as if they're real. She's able to sort of weave little details into a story and, and then refer to them again and again. And she makes them appear to be real in my mind. I love her descriptions. They're so concise. Uh, sometimes she goes a little overboard with using the word muttered. <laughs> I think she likes that word when it comes to dialogue because it's either Harry is muttering or Hermione is muttering or <laughs> Snape is muttering. Maybe I'm just catching on to that word. I'm not sure what, what that could be. It could just be a psychological thing. So I... The story, and the story is put together so well. Um, she really has a gift of, of sort of sort of arranging a story so that it is it makes sense. And um, the story, just sort of from beginning to end, sort of has a, has a flow and has a pattern. Like, it's unmistakable. And it's clear that she puts a lot of thought into this story and uh you know she she is strategically working through all the ins and outs of the story and she's setting up rules and those rules are followed and patterns of behavior and i don't know it's just it's really amazing she's i don't know i'm really impressed by this author i haven't read a fiction writer before who is as good at conveying a story as J.K. Rowling. I'm serious. And um, so, so pleased to um, be reading the Harry Potter series or at least listening to the audiobook. And I'm looking forward to reading the audiobook too, or reading the book too. Um, there's also something else I'm looking forward to. Now, I did go to see Fantastic Beasts. Uh, that's a movie. It's going to be a series, another series of five that J.K. Rowling's worked on. Another series of five books, I guess. And uh, so I'm becoming curious about what are the elements of those stories that J.K. Rowling is going to emphasize and bring out. I'm curious about how her style is going to change when she flips from I guess one story to the next, although they're not necessarily one story to the next one. is like a, uh, they're sort of, um, related. They're sort of in the same universe because after all it is wizards battling each other, <laughs> which is, 
what's going on in Harry Potter. I tell you, I really have been enjoying the Harry Potter series and listening to the audiobooks. And I'm so pleased that I've got like three or four more books to go. <laughs> so uh, there's a lot more to enjoy. By the way, I really did enjoy the Chamber of Secrets story. I mean, it's, wow. You know, it's kind of funny. It sounds, it seems to me like if I were a director of one of the Harry Potter stories and I was going to put this all together, I would definitely, it's not a one person effort to put these movies together because they truly are fairly complex and there's a lot of detail. And, you know, I can imagine the director asking themselves, what detail am I going to leave in and what details am I going to keep out? I've only got two hours to tell this incredibly intricate story with twists and turns, and, you know, and how am I going to pull it all together? You know, I really admire the people who write the screenplays for these movies. <laughs> they really have to be on the ball, right? Yeah, and read this story again and again and again and uh, try to pull something together that mimics the Harry Potter series. Anyway, so pleased about that and so pleased about my possible plans to eventually, I'm going to go to Universal Studios and check out Harry Potter's Wizarding World, Wizarding World at the Amusement Park. So that's exciting. I'm not sure when I'm going to go. Who knows? I might just go in December sometime during the Christmas period. We'll see. Anyway, been reading J.K. Rowling, enjoying that. So very pleased with that. So I guess it's time to move on to that segment where we are discussing Panati's Extraordinary Origins of Everyday Things. And I figured what we've done in the past is we've gone through shampoo and we've gone through um, Christmas or th we went to th Thanksgiving and now we're going to go through and we went through toothpaste. Yeah, we did toothpaste. And so now I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to do soap? <laughs> we're all doing different, different kinds of soap. We've got the, the, uh, washing soap, got the teeth soap. We got the hair soap. Why I'm focusing in on soap, I don't know. I think it might be because you can relate to soap. I can relate to soap. Everyone can relate to soap. And soap sounds to me like an interesting origin story. So let's find out more about soap. So the subtitle in this section uh, starts, it says, Soap, 600 BC Phoenicia. So let me see if I can remember where Phoenicia is. Hey, Google, where is Phoenicia? You've got several options. Phoenicia restaurants, Phoenicia Greek and Lebanese cuisine, and Phoenicia specialty foods. I've sent these to your phone. Oh, thank you. Hey, Google, define Phoenicia. Here's the definition of Phoenician. A member of a Semitic people inhabiting ancient Phoenicia and its colonies. The Phoenicians prospered from trade and manufacturing until the capital, Tyre, was sacked by Alexander the Great in 332 BC. Interesting. Um, hey Google, volume level five. <laughs> hey Google, where is Tyre? Tyre, Lebanon is 7,487 miles away. Okay, so that's where Phoenicia is. It's near Lebanon. <laughs> okay, so it's essentially the Middle East, right? Okay, so so here we go with the reading. A staple of every bathroom, soap has served a variety of cleansing and medicinal purposes since its discovery. Whoa, I didn't know it had medicinal purposes. It has been in and out of vogue, praised as the acme of civilization by one nation, while scorned as an excess of fastidi fastidiousness by a neighbor. About 4,000 years ago, the Hittites of Asia Minor cleaned their hands with the ash of the soap wort plant suspended in water. In the same era, the Sumerians in Ur concocted alkali solutions to wash themselves. Technically, neither of these preparations was soap. So, though close to uh, though close to the actual product, which was developed in 600 BC, 
by the seafaring Phoenicians. In the process that today is known as saponification, the Phoenicians boiled goat fat, water, and ash. Oh, I'm sorry, goat fat. <laughs> goat fat. Goat fat, water, and ash high in potassium carbonate, permitting the liquid to evaporate to form solid waxy soap. Oh, so goat fat, ash, and what else? Water. Goat fat, ash. Essentially, goat fat and ash. Mm, potassium. Over the next 20 centuries, the fortunes of soap would follow closely the beliefs of Western hygiene and religion. During the Middle Ages, for example, when the Christian church warned of the evils of exposing the flesh, even to bathe, production of soap virtually came to a halt. And when medical science later identified bacteria as a leading cause of disease, soap production soared. Throughout all these years, soap variously scented and colored was essentially the same product as that developed by the Venetians. Not until a factory accident in 1879 would a new and truly novel soap surface. Floating soap, whoa. One morning in 1878, 32-year-old Harley Proctor decided that the soap and candle company founded by his father should produce a new creamy white, delicately scented soap, one to compete with the finest imported Castile soaps of the day. As suppliers of soap to the Union Army during the Civil War, the company was suited to such a challenge, and Proctor's cousin, James Gamble, a chemist, soon produced the desired product. Named simply white soap, it yielded a rich lather, even in cold water, and had a smooth, homogeneous consistency. Proctor's and Gamble's white soap was not yet christened ivory, nor did it then float. Soap production began, and the product sold well. One day, a factory worker overseeing soap fats broke for lunch, forgetting to switch off the master mixing machine. On returning, he realized that too much air had been whipped into the soapy solution. Reluctant to discard the batch, he poured it into hardened and cutting frames. Pardon, poured it into hardening and cutting frames. And bars of history's first air-laden floating soap were delivered to regional stores. Consumer reaction was almost immediate. The factory was swamped with letters requesting more of the remarkable soap that could not be lost under murky water because it bobbed up to the surface. Oh, that's the significance of soap floating in water. I actually didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know that that was significant. I just don't take a lot of baths. Fascinating. And I didn't know that what made the ivory soap float was that it was uh, had um, air whipped into it. Perceiving they were beneficiaries of a fortunate accident, Herr Harley Proctor and James Gamble ordered all that all white soap from then on be given an extra long whipping. White soap, though, was too prosaic a label for such an innovative product. Mulling over a long list of possible names one Sunday morning in church, Harley Proctor was inspired by a single word. When the pastor read the 45th Psalm, all thy garments smell of myrrh and aloe and cassia out of the ivory palaces. Thereby they have made these thee glad. The first bars of ivory soap debuted in October 1879, the same month that Thomas Edison successfully tested the incandescent light bulb two events seemingly unrelated. But the astute businessman Harley Proctor foresaw that the electric light would virtually snuff out his profitable candle trade. So he decided to heavily promote history's first floating soap. It was Proctor's idea to etch a groove across the middle of each economy-sized economy bar of ivory. It enabled homemakers to decide for themselves whether they wanted one large laundry sized bar or two smaller toilet sized um, toilet sized cakes and the company would only have to manufacture a single item in an effort to test ivory's quality proctor sent the soap to chemistry professors and independent laboratories for analysis one report in particular impressed him it stated that the soap had few impurities only 56 to, out of 100 uh, 56 one hundredths of one percent 
Proctor flipped the negative statement into a positive one, which became the hallmark of the company's campaign. Ivory soap was 99 and 44 one hundredth percent pure. From a psychological standpoint, the phrase was a stroke of advertising genius for the concepts of purity and floatability did much to reinforce each other <laughs> and to sell soap. To further dramatize the soap's purity and mildness, Proctor induced the ivory baby, supplying shopkeepers with life-sized cardboard display posters. Madison Avenue then and now claims that the campaign to persuade American homeowners to produce ivory soap was one of the most effective in the history of advertising. As a young man, Harley Proctor had promised himself that if he was a success in business, he'd retire at age 45. He became such a success because of the floating soap that he permitted himself the luxury of retiring a year early at 44. <laughs> well, good for him. So, um, pretty amazing stuff. Floatability. Who knew that floatability would be a quality of soap that was so important? You know, today, floatability doesn't matter so much. <laughs> why? I don't know. I don't know. I know why. You know, in the past, maybe water was murky, right? And you lose soap. But today, um, water's not that murky. Water's pretty clear. And, um, but that's interesting. I like that idea of floatability being an, an important quality of soap. <laughs> Uh, and then the purity, that's interesting. I wonder what the impurities are. I guess, you know, it's probably some kind of potash and fat that these soaps are put together with. And um, I'm curious what the impurities are <laughs> of soap. Ivory, wow. So basically turn of the century. And, uh, oh, that turn of the last century anyway. Pretty interesting stuff. So I don't know personally what I would do without soap. I love soap. Soap is an important part of my life. And I mean, I use it to wash my hands. Uh, soap is everywhere. Everybody loves soap as far as I know. I think about soap. <laughs> I daydream about soap. <laughs> I mean, soap is awesome. Yeah. Soap is one of those, the good things in life. It's good. All right, so. Thank you very much. Panati's um, description of extraordinary origins to everyday things. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. So let's go into the question and answer period. So if you recall, the question and answer period is just a time for you to listen to what I have to say uh, when I answer questions posed by a Kindle ebook that I purchased a couple of weeks ago. And it's been going pretty well. I'm, I've already made it to like 400 questions. And so I'm answering questions about my past and my personal experience. And this is all done in an effort to help you understand me a little bit more. So question number 406, would you ever get married? And the answer is, well, uh, yes, I have been married. I've been married twice. The first time I was married was to Charlene Stanfield. And the second time I was married was to your mom, Sheila McFarlane. And um, my first marriage uh, was, took, it was, it was lasted about two, two and a half years. And my second marriage to Sheila lasted about 10 years give or take. And um, so, yeah, now I guess the question is, uh, an add-on question would be, would you ever get married again? And I think the answer is it depends. I think, you know, after being married twice, I think I know what it's about. And I've spent about 12 years of my life married. And you would have to be you know, the circumstances would have to come together right. Um, I think it would have to be someone fairly special and uh, it would just have to make sense economically and, um, you know, my lifestyle and whatever. It would all have to make sense. 
Though I think my bias, though, is not to get married again. Um, been there, done that. And um, I think right now what I'm thinking is that um, I think that there is a benefit to having distance in relationship. I think that when you're too close to one another, like joined at the hip, uh, that is an opportunity for disagreements to arise, even petty disagreements that are hard to negotiate. Um, and it's especially challenging when you live in the same house with them. You know, there's the, the question of chores comes up and how to spend money, you know, particularly if you join bank accounts. You know, this, this, this closeness, this joining is fertile ground for disagreement and bad feelings to develop. And I think that if there's some separation, like maybe you live in two different places or you never join bank accounts or you're each responsible for your own pad, so to speak, and its cleanliness, that there is a much less, there's a much reduced risk of arguments sort of um, affecting the relationship negatively. So, you know, I think Right now, what I'm thinking is that separation, some kind of buffer between the two mates is good. And I think that would create longevity in a relationship. So that's those are along the lines that I'm thinking now. Because just from a strategic standpoint, I'm recognizing that too much closeness can be really difficult to manage. You know, sleeping in the same bed with another person that's really close and that kind of closeness i mean it that it's fine to do that every once in a while but like doing it every night is i think it can be a real strain on a relationship so um that's kind of where i am right now i mean if and the question specifically is about marriage i think that if the marriage has has some kind of built-in space where uh, each person can exercise their autonomy and not feel limited by the closeness that that has the greatest chance of working. So, hooray! You know, only, it only took me 12 years to figure that out. <laughs> only 12! So anyway, that's what I'm looking for in relationship now. Um, and so I think it is rather unlikely that I will ever get involved in the same kind of stereotypical marriage that people have today. Okay, good question. Next question. Question number 407, have you ever been married? And I just answered that question. <laughs> yeah, I sure have, I've been married twice. Question number 408, what are your top five websites? Okay, my top five websites. Well, I'll just, rattle a couple off. First of all, I think my, my top website is YouTube. I love youtube.com. Yep. And then my next one would be um, my email program, Yahoo Mail. Although other people have Gmail and stuff. I like it because I like, I like getting email. <laughs> and I like sending emails. Emails is good. I sp and I check it every day. Uh, what's another website? I like reddit.com, R-E-D-D-I-T.com. That's a fun website. Between YouTube and Reddit, what other uh, websites are there that I like? And my mail program, let me think. Well, I like Wikipedia. That's an awesome website. Uh, it's one of my favorite websites. And it's also a website that I like giving to in a charitable manner. I like Wikipedia because it really is the storehouse of all knowledge. And I, I think it's important to support that. I think a lot of problems in the world could be traced to a lack of knowledge. And the more money and influence that Wikipedia has, the better. Because I think it's that education. Education is really helpful and it'll help basically pull pull the world out of mediocrity and into amazingness. So that's, that's four, right? Is that four? 
yeah, Wikipedia, uh, YouTube, Reddit, and my email program. And what's the fifth, the fifth website that I love so much? Well, you know what? There is a website that I go to all the time, and that's Bing News. <laughs> that's right. I like to get my news from Bing.com. I used to really be a believer in Google News, but Google changed their news website, and I just don't care for it anymore. It doesn't provide the content that I want to read. So I tend to get a lot of my news from that news aggregator called Bing News. It essentially aggregates all the streams of all the newspapers and sorts them into top stories and entertainment and sports and health and stuff like that. But, you know, I, I like I like reading the news. What can I say? So I think those are my top five websites, the ones that I tend to go to a lot. Next question. Question number 409. What fictitious character do you wish came to life? <laughs> what fictitious character do I wish came to life? Well, the first character that came to mind in my mind is Santa Claus. That would be awesome. I would love Santa Claus to come to life. What fictitious character? Oh, I wish God existed. That would be awesome. <laughs> the wizard in the sky. That would be totally amazing. Uh, what other fictitious characters do I wish came to life? Um, what fictitious characters do I wish came to life? Well, Superman, of course. That would be awesome to have Superman around. Um, what other fictitious character do you wish came to life? You know, I think it'd be neat to uh, have magical unicorns exist. <laughs> I wish unicorns existed. They're so awesome. What other fictitious character do I wish came to, to life? Hmm. Huh. Well, I like the superheroes. Any of the good superheroes I'd be happy to have in the world. That'd be awesome. Um, what else? Hmm. I don't know. There's so many. Okay, next question. Question 410. When was your first crush? Oh, that's a good question. Um, when was my first crush? Let's see. I think that was probably sixth grade. Melissa White. Uh, what? When was that? Sixth grade means that I was... Uh, sixth grade how old was I in sixth grade so I was five in kindergarten six in first so I'm adding five so 11 11 years old and um, boy I can't believe I was even 11 years old <laughs> uh, so 11 years old means it was uh, what was the uh, the date uh, 11 plus 71 is 82. So 1982. That's right. And my first crush was Melissa White. I wonder where she is. What what she's going? What she's doing these days? It'd be interesting to track her down. Nah. But actually, it also would not be interesting. <laughs> it wasn't that interesting of a crush. Yeah. Next question. Uh, 411. Did you succeed in dating him or her? Uh, no, not really. <laughs> we hung out and held hands. Uh, that's about it. Next question. Um, question number 412. Do you believe in destiny? So, you know, I believe in destiny in some way, in some manner of speaking. Um, I am a determinist, which means that I believe that uh, all actions occur according to natural processes. And um, 
So, I mean, does that imply uh, that a destiny exists? Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe not, uh, but maybe it does. Um, so I believe in a clockwork universe. And so... I don't think I believe in destiny as sort of other people to believe in destiny. That is, where the future is really predictable and, or predictable by something. And that you can get to know it and that... Or that there is some kind of mystical intelligence that... Um, sort of has a destiny in mind or puts something in your path. Um, that's not the kind of destiny I believe in. My kind of destiny is more of a um, chemical chemistry destiny, where if you add one solution to another solution, you'll get a mixture that will have this kind of characteristic. It's a physics destiny. You know, it's sort of like if I have this much kinetic energy and it rams into something with this much kinetic energy, then the result will be the sum of the kinetic energies. <laughs> it's it's that. It's that. It's conservation of matter. It's conservation of mass, conservation of energy. In that respect, when it comes to the conservation rules, I believe in destiny. <laughs> So my destiny is not as um, whimsical as other people's beliefs about destiny. Yeah, mine's definitely more um, mechanical. I believe in a mechanical destiny. Next question. Question number 413, do you believe in free will? And the answer is I don't. Uh, as a person who is an advocate for determinism. I don't believe that free will exists. I don't see any room for it in the current scientific explanation of the world, and that's okay. You know, computers are bound by deterministic rules, and they do amazing analysis and processing and thinking. And, you know, it's all about, I think, for me, human beings are all... Um, input-output machines. You know, they're all feedback response systems. And you can have a feedback response system act within its environment, make choices, make decisions. Like a robot, say, move like a Roomba, right? A, a Roomba um, sweeping up the floor in your living room, making decisions about where walls are and responding to its environment through a feedback response system. I think basically human beings are Roombas. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so no, I don't. I don't think we have free will. You know, everything that we know, we that knowledge all comes from our senses, or from sense data and deductions that our mind makes within sense data. And um, yeah. So next question. Question number four hundred fourteen. If you could talk to an animal, which would you choose? Hmm. If I could talk to any animal, well, I think I could. I would like to talk to birds. I would love to talk to birds. Oh, I'd like to like to talk to dogs too. Birds and dogs. Yeah. You know, if I had the power to talk to birds and dogs, man, my life would be totally awesome. <laughs> Can you imagine? Um just the like reconnaissance information that I could get from birds and from dogs with their sense of smell and um, with the birds with their sense of sight and their ability to roam. Wow, that would be amazing. I mean, just having that skill to talk to birds and to talk to dogs, that would be amazing. Um, what if I could talk to another animal, which would I choose? Mm, dolphins. Absolutely. Dolphins sound like really awesome, really awesome animals to get to know. And, you know, it would open up. I mean, if I knew dolphins, it would really open up the oceans to me. I think that would be amazing. Yeah, that would be an amazing adventure. 
I already have a movie and a novel and a plot boil <laughs> bubbling up in my mind about the boy who could talk to dolphins. <laughs> that sounds like a great movie. Okay, next question. 415, chocolate or vanilla? Oh, man. They're both good. So I say, why not both? I love chocolate and I love vanilla. So I'd say both. Question number 416, do you have piercings? And the answer is no, I don't. Question number 417, do you have tattoos? And the answer is no, I don't. So here's the thing. I do have a few thoughts about tattoos. Um, you know, I can understand, human beings are meaning makers, right? And we love symbols to help us sort of take that meaning and freeze it into something. Um, that's long lasting, like our words and like our pictures, right? Our, our, our artwork. And that's great. And, you know, this, first of all, I love skin and the way it looks. It's just in general, beautiful. And here's the thing about putting any marks on the skin is that in general, I think that putting marks on the skin of any kind, like scarification or whatever, you know, those, making those marks, you can add meaning, you could like sort of have a personal meaning to the mark and that's great. But here's the thing, meanings change. <laughs> meanings change over time. And I mean, they just do. And to have a permanent mark on your body like that, I think I'd be more an advocate of tattoos if all tattoos were temporary. I mean, in some way they are. They're actually quite hard to remove. Um, so, uh, I mean, that's fine. But here's the thing. I'm also concerned about the impact to health. So for me, there, there's like two elements, the aesthetic impact and the health impact. For this, the aesthetic impact, you know, Maybe an image or figure on your arm has meaning to you, but chances are it doesn't have the same meaning to other people. And, you know, it can create uh, communication that's dis that might be distorted. Um, you know, people can sort of misunderstand what these marks on your skin mean. You know, marks on your skin signal ideas to other people. There's signals that you're transmitting to others. And I like the idea of sort of, you know, thoughtfully conveying messages. And anyway, you know, people can thoughtfully convey signals with their clothing. And, you know, it's, it's like also like wearing a shirt all day, every day, and not ever taking it off. <laughs> You know, you're conveying a signal and you're sort of stuck. And if you change, then then somehow the signal is no longer appropriate to you. Same is true with tattoos. So I think what I don't like about tattoos is their permanence. You know, if tattoos could be changed, that'd be great. But since they can't, they're more or less permanent. I think I've got a problem with them, with that idea. Because here's the thing, human beings are not static. Our situation change, our lives change, and to intentionally put something static on such a dynamic being, right? A being who's continuously changing is a contradiction. So I don't like the idea. I particularly don't like the idea that, um, you know, these tattoos might affect health. I've heard about the inks being a problem, how they are designed to stay in the body. And um, these inks, I guess, may have heavy metals or whatever. I don't, I don't quite understand it. But I think that they also travel inside the body, some of them. Like I've heard of stories of people who've had uh, tattoo ink travel to their um, lymph nodes. And that um, you know, when they go into doctor's offices and get, uh, various kinds of like, um, like MRIs or x-rays or whatever, the heavy metals show up and they can show up as a mark that looks like 
some other disease like cancer or whatever, like a tumor or whatever. You know, I've heard of these stories. I don't know if they're true, but that risk seems like it's too much of a price to pay for just signaling a message to other people or maybe even myself. You know, I think more appropriate would be like a piece of jewelry, something that you could take off, something that you could change, like a ring or a bracelet or an amulet, you know, or a necklace. You know, that, that way of sort of retaining meaning makes a lot more sense. Also photographs, also a great way to keep meaning. You could put photographs on your wall or things like that. So I'm really not a big fan of tattooing. I think that it is unnecessarily permanent. Yeah, yeah. And uh, not unwise, unwise, especially for such dynamic beings as human beings. Okay, next question. Oh, there's another aspect which I don't care for. Um, I mentioned about the aesthetic appearance of tattoos, and the fact is they do not age well. You know, the skin is a dynamic moving thing, and it shifts in uh, texture, and it shifts in suppleness, <laughs> and it sometimes sags, and it looks distorted if you gain weight, distorted if you lose weight. And then, you know, what I notice is that when I look at a tattoo, it just looks like it's all the same color. Even if it's multicolored, it's like this green black shade and it's just an appealing, you know, skin, skin is beautiful in its own right. And I think it is fine unchanged and it's really, and wouldn't it be great if the tattoo colors were even more dramatic and permanent because I don't know, old tattoos just look like green and black and blurry. <sighs> They're just not appealing anymore to me. Next question. Um, okay. Question number 418. Are you or were you ever afraid of needles? And I'm not afraid of needles. <laughs> um, I'm not unnecessarily afraid of needles. Um, so no, I'm not afraid of needles. I'm fine. Like I'm fine getting like a, a shot in the arm or whatever like that. That's perfectly okay. Um, doesn't bother me. 419, do you have a sense of direction? And the answer to that question is yes. I have a really strong ability to remember landmarks and retain that information and hike in the mountains and find my way back. I don't quite, it's, it's really quite a miraculous power that I have. And interestingly enough, because I don't, don't do a lot of hiking, I don't utilize it very much except when I'm driving. And, uh, so yeah, I have a really strong ability to remember where I've been and where I'm going. So it's very rare that I get lost. I have a clear sense of direction. I kind of know which direction, east, west, north, and south is wherever I walk. Pretty much, I can figure it out. So um, that's cool. That's that's a cool thing about me. So I think it, I, I have a suspicion that this ability to sort of recognize where I am and where I'm going was something that was a skill that I developed in childhood. Mm -hmm. I think because I spent so much time walking around as a wild child, as a feral child in the, uh, while I was growing up, like I spent a lot of time outside, my brain just sort of figured out the way to find the way home. And so I can do it. It's like a little miracle. It's a superpower that I have. I can find my way home. So yeah, I do have a good sense of direction. Now, there are other people who don't have a good sense of direction. For example, your mom, Sheila, I'll tell you what, um, she no sense of direction. <laughs> Where are we? <laughs> it's pretty funny. I'm sure she has a fi very fine and average sense of direction. Uh, though, um, though, though it's 
it's kind of funny sometimes. There are people with more or less abilities to sort of track where they are. Okay, question number 420. Have you ever gotten lost for hours? And yeah, I sure have. I sure have gotten lost for hours. For hours? Actually, that would be an overstatement. I've been lost for a little while. You know, 20, 30 minutes, I think, might be the max amount of time that I've been lost. You know, it can happen. And uh, it's happened to me in the past. It doesn't happen so much anymore because now I've got, you know, GPS in my car and GPS in my cell phone. Basically, I'm never lost. Thankfully, because of technology. And, but, you know, in the past, where, where people sort of use maps, paper maps. I remember using paper maps. And even before that, when I wasn't using maps at all, I would get lost on occasion. I'd never, I don't think I ever got really ever super concerned about it. It's just something that, you know, occurs over time. You know, it's just something that given time, you find your way back. All right, next question. Question number 421, what things make you angry? Hmm. Well, you know what? It's not about a certain thing. It's mostly about this idea of, you know, this is the way things are and this is the way I want them to be. And if there's a sufficient disconnect between those things, um, I there is a potential to become angry about it. So... Um, these days, I'm developing newer perspectives. I'm, I'm trying to be more flexible in how I'm arriving at whether things are good or bad. And um, by looking, by sort of exercising my freedom to look at events, external events in different ways. And because of that, I think I get angry a lot less often and my anger is less severe. Uh, because I'm able to sort of recognize what basket of values is being preserved at the time. And uh, I know that the basket of values might be different depending on how I perceive the external event. So anyway, I think that flexibility is a superpower. It also means that my life is a lot more peaceful. Ah, oh, my life is more peaceful and I'm glad for it. So it, it, by the way, it's a skill worth developing, you know, and that is that skill specifically is flexibility of your perspective. If you want peace, I think it's really important for you to exercise flexibility and perspective. Yeah. So that's just a little bit of parental advice for you. <laughs> a little bit of fatherly advice. All right. Next question. Question number 422, what make what things make you anxious? Oh, that's a really good question. And it's something I'm going to have to think about. What makes me anxious? Well, I think when I when my health takes a turn for the worse. But it has to be fairly dramatic. It doesn't happen very often like once every one or two decades. <laughs> Um, anything else? Thankfully, nothing else. <laughs> like I don't, I'm not afraid of heights. I'm not afraid of falling. I'm not afraid of knives or snakes or blood. Although I have been known to turn white when looking at my own blood. Um, but that was almost a subconscious thing that happened. I... It, it wasn't because I have any concerns or interests about blood. I'm not afraid of spiders. I'm not, af I'm not afraid of ticks or anything like that. You know, I have concerns, you know, but I'm not afraid of stuff. Like, I'm fine going to horror films and I'm fine. Um, you know, not anymore. Thank goodness. I used to be quite concerned about stuff. And in my old age, I've learned better, I think. 
It's nice how old age makes you a little bit more mild. I really appreciate that. You know, you just get smarter. You develop more perspective about the world and your place in it. And thankfully, your anxiety goes away. So that's very nice. And you also tend to be happier because you can make comparisons between yourself and others and notice that you live the life of a king. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Okay. Next question. Question number 423. What things get you excited? Well, adventure gets me excited. Adventure and you know what else I like? What gets me excited? Getting in and among groups of people. I love groups of people. So excited in a, in a fun way. Like I like groups of people and I tend to be pretty social or can get pretty social. And um, so I like groups of people. What are the things, what did I, what did I say? God, what was the other thing that I said got me excited? <laughs> well, believe it or not, reading and story and learning. Learning gets me excited. Learning gets me excited. Exercise gets me excited. And learning and exercise gets me excited. People get me excited. Learning, exercise, and people. And what else gets me excited again? <laughs> what was that first thing that I said? Oh man, I can't remember. Hmm. Well, that's actually a pretty good uh, summary of what gets me excited. Learning, people, and exercise. Okay, next question. Question number 424. What would your wrestler stage name be? <laughs> I don't know. Um, my wrestler stage name. Oh, I don't know. My wrestler stage name. How about Hopeful Harry? <laughs> I don't know. Next question. Question number 425. Have you ever needed glasses? And oh yeah, I sure have. I think I started wearing glasses when I was maybe a sophomore in high school. I remember the day that I got glasses. Uh, I was with my mom and maybe my brother and I put the glasses on and shazam! I could not believe the detail in the trees and in the clouds that was before me. I was like stunning, stunning to see the change all around me and to see the details. Apparently I had gone for a couple years with uh, less than perfect vision and I just didn't notice. <laughs> So I'm really thankful that my parents took me to uh, the optometrist to get my eyes checked out. And in fact, Emily, that's a concern for me. Uh, I, like I said, I uh, got glasses when I was maybe a sophomore in high school. And in regard to you, you're a freshman in high school now. I think it's important that you go to the optometrist and get your eyes checked out so that you don't have to sort of suffer from blurry vision. I mean, it's not a big deal if you can read books and uh, look at the chalkboard and things like that. If you have just minor myopia, it's fine not to have glasses. Though I'll tell you what, there, there it does take something away from your enjoyment of being in the world if your vision is a little blurry. And I know as a young person, I was really interested in my studies and I did a lot of close-up work and uh, through reading. And because of that, I needed glasses and I got glasses. I had glasses for like 20 years. I had glasses until like I was 40 years old until recently I've just gotten contacts. I've had contacts for about, maybe about five years now and I love them. And um, it occurs to me that I 
probably would have enjoyed having glasses. I mean, would have, would have enjoyed having contacts if I sort of discovered them earlier. Now, the, the, the reason that I didn't escape glasses any earlier was because, mainly because I was rather ignorant of contacts and also because I decided that I did not want LASIK. And that decision still holds true. I, I don't think I want LASIK. I am a little bit concerned about fooling with this optic system of mine because um, it is my bread and butter. You know, it's how I make a living and I'm already experiencing challenges with my eyes. And, um, you know, I don't want to do any irreparable harm to my eyeballs, <laughs> you know. So yeah, definitely I'm fine with contacts and they're great. And I, I could see staying with contacts for the long term. Okay, next question. Um, question number 426, do you believe you are attractive? And the answer to that question is yes, I do. I do believe that. Question, next question. Question number 427, are you a fan of magic tricks? And yeah, I am, I love magic. I definitely don't go see magicians as often as I probably ought to, but yeah, there, in fact, there's a magic show coming up in December. I, I'm curious if you're interested in attending. You know, Emily, if you are interested in attending, shoot me a text and uh, we can go see that magic show. I think it's happening the first week of December. Next question. Uh, question number 428, do you know any magic tricks? You know, there was a time, a period in my life when I was memorizing magic tricks and getting to know them. And I could probably perform one or two of them now, but I would be rusty. The thing about magic is that it takes practice in order to pull the, the magic off. And so I wouldn't be that good at it. Maybe I could do one or two magic tricks that are not that impressive, <laughs> that are easy to remember. Next question. Question number 428, do you know, oh, 429. Do you spend a lot of time looking at the mirror? <laughs> I don't think I spend more time than anyone else looking at the mirror. I'm pretty sure that there are a lot of people who look at the mirror more than I do. For the most part, I look in the mirror in the mornings just to make sure that I'm um, presentable as I walk out the door. And, you know, I look at the mirror every time I wash my hands or brush my teeth. So I pretty much know what I look like. <laughs> I love mirrors, by the way. They sure are wonderful. What I like about mirrors is that they give me feedback. Well, or maybe they don't give me feedback, but at least I can use that data, use that information to help me sort of craft my appearance. And I appreciate that. Thank you very much, mirrors, and the feedback process. Next question, can you type fast? Question number 430. So I can type, but I don't think I can type fast or much faster than anybody else can. I took a typing class and at Allen Hancock College back in like 1999, 1998. And so I learned how to type relatively late in life, like when I was 27, 28 years old. And um, so I'm not that good at it. There's also another thing. When I type a lot, I tend to get carpal tunnel syndrome or something similar to it. And um, it hurts my fingers. Now, I, that is a story. That is a very old story for me. It may not be true anymore. I've been weightlifting. I've been strengthening my fingers and my tendons. And that may not be the case anymore. You know, it might be an interesting task or an experiment to check out just how much I can uh, type. Anyway, Emily, I'm going to wrap this uh, video up. Thank you for spending some time with me. Really appreciate you coming uh, along with me uh, and enjoying this time together. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. I'll see you tomorrow. And I wish you peace and happiness and joy and wonder 
and all the good things in life. I'll talk to you later, girl. All right? Take it easy.